Okay, we'll go ahead and get started as we're admitting a few more people into the room. It's nice to see some uh, familiar names and faces. Welcome to the uh, CVSA's October virtual presentation, Cannabinoids, Friend or Foe in Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to introduce myself. My name is Debbie Conklin. My involvement with CVSA started with organizing the Run for the Bucket in Wisconsin shortly after my son's CVS diagnosis in 2005. In 2007, I joined the CVSA Board of Directors, and in 2016, I became the Program Director. If you have contacted the office recently in the last few years, you have probably talked to me. For the duration of the presentation, you'll all be muted. Please do not unmute yourself as background noise is distracting to both the speaker and those attending. Um, if you're not muted, we will ask you to mute yourself and we do reserve the right to remove you from the meeting if you don't stay muted. Also, we are going to be recording this presentation for later viewing on our YouTube channel. So please don't use your own recording device as it will be available to everyone. If you're having trouble with your audio, you may consider using your phone to call in instead of using your computer speaker. We have about 250 people registered for this presentation. Unfortunately, that means there may not be enough time to get to everyone's questions during the Q&A session, but please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box at any time. We will ask questions during the time we have available at the end. And now for the main attraction. We would like to welcome Dr. Thangam Venkatesan as this month's presenter. Dr. Thangam Venkatesan is a professor of medicine in the Department of Gastroenterology and the director of the Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome for Adults at Freydert and the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. V, as her patients fondly call her, feels quality patient care requires careful listening to the patient's own story of their problem so as to understand the concerns and goals for care from the patient's perspective. For care to be effective, the patient must remain an active partner of the entire healthcare team. The best quality care requires going the extra mile to obtain the best possible understanding of the patient's condition. Being the head of the committee, Dr. V was the driving force behind the development and publication of the Adult Treatment Guidelines for Adult CVS, which is the first of its kind document outlining diagnosis, treatment, and management of adult CVS. Dr. V has dedicated her career to serving adult CVS patients not only in the United States, but across the globe, as well as doing research to advance our understanding of CVS. So thank you very much, Dr. V, for spending time with us today, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Debbie, and uh, we were so glad uh, that the CVSA and the ANMS were able to support us in uh, that end of our with publication, development and publication of CVS adult guidelines. It kind of had, it was my baby, but had a very long gestational period. We were glad we were able to deliver. So onto my talk, uh, I know there's a lot of interest in cannabis and how this plays a role in cyclic vomiting syndrome. So hopefully I will give you a snapshot of uh, what cannabis is, what cannabinoids are, and um, are they helpful? or are they harmful in cyclic vomiting syndrome? And these are my disclosures. Uh, most of the funding really is for studies that I perform in CVS. Uh, my learning objectives or our learning objectives for today will be to discuss cannabis use in the US, uh, the composition of cannabis and cannabinoids. I'm gonna review both beneficial and adverse effects of cannabinoids as it pertains to CVS and the GI system. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about the clinical characteristics, the diagnosis and management of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Uh, this unfortunately is talked about a lot, but it's probably one of the most misunderstood diagnoses and syndromes um, that I can think of. And so we need to know what cannabinoids are. And cannabinoids are basically defined as compounds that have an affinity for cannabinoid receptors. Uh, we have cannabinoid receptors that are densely distributed throughout the body and in the brain, and also in areas uh, which are responsible or are important for nausea and vomiting in the brain. We classify cannabinoids into phytocannabinoids. So phyto means plants. So this is being derived from plants and that would refer to cannabis. 
And then we actually have something called endocannabinoids. And I don't know how many of you know about this, but we actually produce substances which closely resemble marijuana. Uh, and we produce this on demand. And so it's synthesized both in humans and animals. And then finally, we have synthetic cannabinoids or compounds that are manufactured like nabilone and dronabinol. And so when you think about phytocannabinoids or marijuana, this is derived from the cannabis plant. It has been in use since the Neolithic period. And this is actually a picture of Lord Shiva uh, drinking the elixir there. And that is actually a cannabis or a marijuana edible. And so even mythology talks about men consuming cannabis or marijuana for various purposes. And this was thought to be the elixir of life and virility and so on. And um, I think marijuana has been used by human beings for several centuries. Uh, but finally, it was only in the 60s that we were able to identify and actually characterize the compounds that were present in marijuana, which really led to very important discoveries. Uh, there is something called cannabidiol, which is one of the major constituents of marijuana. And this is called, and this was uh, discovered in 1963. And then we had the discovery of THC or tetrahydrocannabinol in 1964. And this was by Raphael McCollum, who is considered the father of THC. And he's actually 90 years old now. And uh, these were very important discoveries that led to an advancement in our understanding of cannabis, marijuana, and the endocannabinoid system, and how it plays an important role in nausea, vomiting, stress, and thermogenesis, and so many other important functions. And then uh, we had the discovery, or people discovered that there were receptors in our body, and uh, an important receptor, there are two types of cannabinoid receptors. One is the cannabinoid type one receptor, or CB1R, and the second one was the CB2 receptor. And then we discovered that there were ligands. So there was something called AEA. Now, we're, this, is, this refers to the endocannabinoid, something we actually synthesize or make in our body. And then uh, the CB2 receptor was cloned in 1993. And so I think these were very important discoveries. Uh, what do we know about phytocannabinoids? Like I said, they're derived from the plant. Um, and the plant is referred to um, as uh, cannabis, and you have two species, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Uh, the indica uh, species is used less often, um, and cannabis actually has, or marijuana that we use, has as many as 200 constituents. The reason I try to refrain from using the word marijuana, though it's often used, is it does have some racist undertones uh, to it. So I prefer to use the word cannabis. But in any case, um, cannabis has many constituents. And there are two important constituents. One is tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol. Uh, the important differences between THC and cannabidiol or CBD is that CBD is actually not psychoactive. And it actually is not a true cannabinoid in that it does not act on cannabinoid receptors. It actually acts on 5-HT1A receptors. Um, and other things that happen is, you know, when you smoke it, people obviously, you know, smoke it as cigarettes. And when you heat the plant, you convert THCA to THC and CBDA to CBD. And, um, you know, really marijuana has gone mainstream. So it's very important that we understand all the implications of its use. Um, if you look at this map, uh, the black areas show states where it has been completely legalized, both for recreational and medical purposes. And then you have areas in green or different shades of green where it has been partially legalized. So it can either be used for medical purposes or recreational purposes or both. And um, really most states have decriminalized uh, the use of marijuana. And this occurred uh, several years ago. But uh, be as it may, you can tell from this map uh, that there is certainly an increasing use uh, of marijuana in our country. And um, I know I have a lot of patients there, but and possibly there are some people who have never used marijuana and some people have used it sometime. And marijuana refers to the ripe leaves, flowers, stems, and seeds of either cannabis sativa or cannabis indica. 
uh, you know, I was informed or taught by my children that uh, they call it skunk because it stinks. Um, I really almost have never seen a joint um, and I'm a complete teetotaler. So I do know a lot about it from a scientific standpoint. Uh, common names for it are weed, herb, pot, grass, bund, bud, sorry, ganja, and Mary Jane. And if there are any physicians or other providers in my audience, I think it's important uh, for physicians to know the common lingo so that we really know what our patients are using. Um, and marijuana is used, either it's most, most commonly smoked, but it is also ingested in the form of food such as brownies, cookies, candy, or tea. Um, it was actually even um, in the form of gummies in Colorado, but uh, then again, uh, this was uh, prohibited because it makes it look innocuous and uh, this was being given to children. Um, and you can obviously smoke marijuana via joints, pipes, water pipes, or vape it. Uh, there is uh, this thing, a phenomenon called dabbing, which is smoking THC rich raisins from the marijuana plant. And um, these uh, marijuana concentrates are called hash oil, honey oil, wax because it has a texture like lip balm and it's also called uh, shatter and the reason i bring this up is that uh, the concentration of thc in these marijuana concentrates is very 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 high and um, so for those people who smoke marijuana it is very important i usually ask my patients do you smoke marijuana or do you do you dab or do you use marijuana concentrate so unfortunately uh, marijuana concentrate has very, very high THC levels, and they range from, as you can see on the slide, from 54 to 69%, and sometimes even 80%. So it's actually changing the entire composition uh, of the plant, uh, marijuana in its natural form. And uh, when we talk about solvent-based or non-solvent-based products, it really depends, or it really is refers to the means of manufacturing these products. Um, and if you go to non-solvent-based products, again, the THC levels are very high, uh, between 40 to 60%. Um, and when you dab, dabbers actually inhale the entire amount in a single breath. And so you're delivering extremely large quantities of THC to the body very quickly. And as a result, there's a very high risk of physical dependence and addiction, particularly with exposure to high concentrations of THC. So that is very important to bear in mind. Um, the kind of product that you're using um, will, will really impact what is going on with people. Higher doses of THC, again, uh, have been shown in multiple studies uh, to produce anxiety, agitation, paranoia, and psycho psychosis. And so there is this paradoxical or biphasic effect where at low doses, um, you may have an anxiolytic effect, but at high doses, you actually have the opposite effect. Um, now, in contrast, the THC content, say, in marijuana plant material like a cigarette is around 15%. Uh, though this may see, though this is lower than uh, the marijuana-based concentrate products, um, this is not good news either. And I want you to look at this map or this very closely. And if you look at this figure, um, you, you can look at the, the green the green line, and then um, you notice this blue line. So if you, if you look at this blue line, it's actually the percentage of THC or the potent, and refers to the potency of cannabis samples which were seized by the DEA. And, in, and between 1995 uh, to 2018, the concentration has gone, gone up from 3.96, around 3% to over 15%, which is a significant increase. And, and then if you look at CBD, which is actually non-psychotropic, uh, the concentration of CBD in a joint has gone down considerably. So I think it is important to understand that the cannabis products that we are uh, using today are very different from what our, perhaps our parents or our grandparents used. And uh, it's really a different beast. So it is very important that we understand that. And um, you know, we all obviously know about the cannabis plant uh, and so on and marijuana use, but some of us may not be aware that there is something called the endocannabinoid system. And it is truly this beautiful system that we have. And uh, the endocannabinoid system is important 
um, to uh, really for so many functions in our body. And the endocannabinoid system basically consists of endocannabinoids, uh, that is anandamide. So anandamide uh, is derived from the word ananda, and ananda uh, means bliss in Sanskrit. And the other endocannabinoid is 2-AG, or 2 arachidonyl glycerol. And I don't want to uh, start, make this sound like a chemistry lesson uh, or a pharmacology uh, lecture, but I think it's important you know about the endocannabinoid system. And so these endocannabinoids then act on CB1 and CB2 receptors, um, I think CB1 receptors are more important um, in the regulation of nausea, vomiting, and stress than CB2 receptors, which are more involved with inflammation and so on. Um, CB1 receptors are found almost everywhere in the brain uh, and the nervous system. And then there are certain enzymes that are actually involved in breaking down or degrading these endocannabinoids. And they're referred to as PA or fatty acid amide hydrolase or MAG lipase. And um, so this is a schematic representation of what happens uh, in our nervous system. Uh, this is a picture of a neuron. And uh, you know we all are faced with stress. Uh, our daily lives and so on are faced with stress. And so the endocannabinoid signaling system actually helps to combat this. And uh, if, if you look at this neuron, uh, there is the CB1 receptor, the purple thingy here, uh, which is located on the presynaptic receptor, which is a little different uh, from other receptors. And so when one uh, is faced with stress, there's actually a production of endocannabinoids. Again, this is an on-demand system. And then this acts on the CB1 receptor. And when this acts on the CB1 receptor, what happens is it actually inhibits neurotransmission. So it's kind of cooling you down a little bit. Um, and when this happens, uh, it restores homeostasis. So there you were, you were stressed. But then uh, you have the picture below and they're kind of, as you can see, kind of happy and walking along. And so this maintains homeostasis. And, um, and again, like I said, these cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids that we uh, manufacture or synthesize in our body are very important in the regulation of nausea and vomiting. Um, and there are many, uh, there are some animal models, but the problem is as investigators, uh, we have a lot of trouble studying nausea and vomiting because, um, you know, gosh, we don't want to be mice and rat, but actually mice and rat don't vomit. So it is very difficult uh, for us to study nausea and vomiting. Um, you know, lucky mice and rat, but uh, not for us. Um, so we have to rely on other animals like ferrets or shrews, um, you know, particularly our basic scientists who work in the lab. Uh, certainly, you know, nobody wants to uh, study this in dogs and obviously um, do human studies to see what goes on uh, with the system. And as I said, um, the important thing is cannabinoids actually inhibit emesis. So it can actually stop vomiting. And this is mediated by its action on CB1 receptors. The dorsal vagal complex is something that's present in your nervous system and the brain. Um, and that is the vomit is part of the vomiting reflex. So when you have um, cannabinoids, they inhibit or can stop vomiting. Um, and, um, you know, that's important. And then we'll discuss as to why marijuana may be doing the opposite effect. It also regulates something called the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is very important um, in the regulation of stress. And we know that uh, stress is a huge trigger for CVS. So again, cannabinoids are very important uh, for all of these functions in our body. Uh, we've learned some lessons from actually our mistakes. Um, and uh, there was this drug called Ramonaban. It was the skinny pill. So you know, you've heard about the marijuana munchies. And uh, so they said, well, um, again, cannabinoids are very important um, in uh, promoting um, appetite and so on. And so they said, well, let's block it. And so they uh, create, they manufactured uh, this particular agent, uh, which is a CB1 receptor antagonist. Though it was a very effective weight loss agent, it was withdrawn from the market because of increased risk of depression and vomiting. So certainly there are lessons uh, that we've learned from this. Um, we've also looked at the endocannabinoid system. I'm sure maybe some of you have participated in these studies with us and thank you for that. Um, and we said something is going on. A lot of people are using cannabis um, and say that it helps. And then, um, you know, we have a whole lot of CVS patients, so something must be going on. Do they have 
uh, some problem with the CD1 receptor or endocannabinoid deficiency and so on. And so when we looked at the study, we looked at CB1 receptors and, we, and then we found that there are certain people who have certain, um, certain genotypes that were associated with an increased risk of CBS. Again, um, this is not, um, you know, has not been translated in a clinical practice in any way. We're not ready for that. It's only an association. Um, you know, again, it's not, a it's, it's not uh, causative, or we do not know if this is causative. So there were certain um, receptors, so certain mutations in certain receptors. The CNR1, it's called RS806380. And um, when you had the uh, AG and GG genotype, it was associated with an increased risk of CVS. Interestingly, the same genotype was associated with cannabis dependent, but it actually had a protective effect. Um, and then there was another um, SNP, uh, which is called RS806368, that was associated with a decreased risk of CVS. And then finally, uh, I think what was most interesting is this particular SNP, uh, the CNR1 RS2023239, which was associated with a positive response to therapy. So, um, you know, hopefully, if we're able to study this further, we can perhaps identify patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome who would respond to certain therapies like amitriptyline and so on. And uh, this really paves the way for uh, personalized uh, medicine. And so I think uh, the moral of the story is that if you uh, didn't remember anything I said, or this, uh, you, know, you were kind of sleeping through it, unfortunately, in the afternoon, all you need to remember is that endocannabinoids make us happy, fat, and dumb. Uh, it makes you cool, calm, and collected. And so does weed, but it has also been associated with hyperemesis and this so-called CHS that everybody is talking about. So what's going on here? Uh, and, and you know, we need to figure this out. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, cannabis, as you know, is the most commonly used illicit drug in the world, though it's been legalized in 33 states in the U.S. along with Washington, D.C., uh, we know that approximately 40% of patients with CVS use cannabis. They're more likely to be male and young. And there's also an association um, with anxiety and depression. Uh, and cannabinoids here have been used as antiemetics, uh, say Marinol in patients who have had cancer and Nabilone. Um, and, and then we have some more cannabis-based medicine. We actually tried approaching this company, but they didn't really kind of get back to us. Um, there's something called Sativex, which is half THC and half CBD. It's delivered by an oromucosal spray. And, um, and so this has been shown to reduce the incidence of delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Um, and again, there are no studies in uh, CVS. But there are problems with uh, cannabis. And so, um, you know, we do know there are studies by some very good researchers. Uh, from Colorado, and they looked at ED visits actually related to marijuana tourism. And if you look at this figure, you can see that, uh, you know, people actually came to Colorado uh, to test out the cannabis because it was one of the states, earlier states that legalized cannabis. And I think, uh, you know, the Colorado residents seem to be a little more kind of staid. But if you look at the, um, the tourists, uh, there was significant number of ED visits related to marijuana tourism. Uh, and this really took off at the time that it was being legalized, as you can see. And so, um, you know, again, this cannabis use seems to be related to increased hospitalizations from vomiting. Uh, but again, we know that unfortunately, even though CVS has been around forever, uh, the Rome Foundation established criteria for diagnosing CVS only in 2006. And, and, and finally, uh, there was a study that we did in the ER and CVS was not recognized in the ED more than 90% at the time. Um, and so whether this is all due to cannabis or whether it's because the ED physicians, our colleagues became better at identifying this pattern, repetitive pattern of vomiting, um, you know, because cannabis became kind of a cool thing, uh, we really don't know. So um, is it a recognition bias contributing to the significant increase is something that we need to study further. And we also did another study and we looked at cyclic vomiting presentations and we looked at ED visits before and after legalization of marijuana. No, these are not the tourists. Uh, these are ED visits before and after legalization. 
And, and um, as you can see, the number of media visits actually uh, doubled. And uh, so I think, um, you know, these are important studies, and I do believe that there is some truth that the marijuana, and again, if you remember, the product that we're using is very, very potent, and using it every day um, is probably uh, really disrupting this natural endocannabinoid signaling that we have in our bodies. And, um, you know, so here came along cyclic vomiting syndrome, a bunch of people decided uh, they have to coin this term. Uh, I know that, you know, many CVS experts, um, including myself, have known that patients with CVS use marijuana. But uh, be as it may, uh, they decided that uh, there is a new entity uh, on the block and they called it cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, but their symptoms are identical to CVS. Um, however, there seemed to be a presentation after prolonged excessive cannabis use. And to make this diagnosis, uh, you needed to uh, show that there is relief of vomiting episodes by sustained cessation of cannabis use. Now, having um, you know, seen so many patients, I know there is a considerable amount of reluctance to stop cannabis for prolonged periods of time. Um, and then supportive remarks, you know, many people said, oh, there's this pathological hot water bathing behavior. I know a lot of you, um, you know, know about it and probably do this when you have a CVS attack. Um, and so say, they said that this is supportive criterion that you may have CHS. Um, and so the CHS really um, came about with many what we call retrospective chart reviews. Um, and um, one of the more commonly cited studies is this case series of 98 patients out of Mayo Clinic. Um, it was a cross-sectional study, and they said, well, there were 98 patients who came in with cyclic vomiting syndrome, but they had chronic regular cannabis use of two to 10 years. Um, so it's unclear. Um, you know, there are so many questions. Um, why does, you know, vomiting occur after 10 years of use, um, and so on and so forth? And I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into that. Um, you know, again, uh, there was the justification for adding CHS was that um, it was thought, or at least um, some experts suggested that it's distinct from CVS. Um, you know, personally, uh, they have identical clinical features, so I'm not sure how distinct it is. Uh, and it, it does exhibit different epidemiology. Um, you know, cannabis use is more common in younger males, and particularly those with anxiety and depression. Um, and then the bathing behavior, which we will talk about. And then some people think, obviously, that it has specific therapy uh, with cannabis cessation. And again, I'll discuss that a little more as we go along. And so if you look at this, these are uh, cannabis patterns. And because people kept talking about CHS, initially we just ignored it and then it just wouldn't go away. And so we had to look at it. And um, so we looked at cannabis patterns in CVS. This was one of the first, this was the first study actually to my knowledge, um, using what we call a validated tool. And so uh, many, many patients were kind enough to answer our questions about cannabis. Uh, most of my patients are female. Uh, the mean age was around 37, the average age. And then if you look at the spy chart, uh, most patients with CVS actually don't use cannabis at all. Uh, I think the, you know, the, the concern I have is this orange uh, small slice or one fifth really of patients who use cannabis more than four times a week. Um, there are some people who use it either monthly or less, um, which is not really so much of a problem or two to four times a month, two to three times a month and so on. And so I think um, really what we're talking about is this 22% or one in five individuals with CVS where the cannabis may, may be making the cyclic vomiting definitely worse. Um, and now, um, you know, you know that most patients who use cannabis will be told to stop it immediately when they go to the emergency room in the hospital, and that's not necessarily the wrong thing to say. Um, however, you know, the paradoxical thing about this is that if you look at self-reported effects of cannabis use in CBS, we find, um, and again, this is per patient report. So this is what patients like you told us when we asked. Um, and so many patients, as you can see, 70% said it reduced vomiting episodes, it reduced the severity of vomiting, reduced abdominal pain, improved appetite. Um, some patients said it actually helped them avoid ED visits or hospitalization. And then there was maybe a third or a less than a third who said they were able to continue working or continue with their studies. Uh, 
And then we looked at cannabis abstinence to see how long people had tried to abstain. Uh, many patients had tried to abstain from cannabis uh, for at least a month, but most patients really did not abstain from cannabis for significantly long periods of time. And unfortunately, a month is not enough uh, to know if it has any effect on your cyclic vomiting. For instance, if you have four episodes a month, um, four, I'm sorry, four episodes a year and you stop it only for a month, you really don't know what that, what that is doing to your vomiting patterns. Um, and so when we looked for CHS, we were unable to clearly find it. There was one person who very specifically said that his uh, vomiting resolved, um, you know, when he stopped cannabis completely. But then, um, you know, after a considerable amount of time, he actually resumed cannabis and he used cannabis with higher CBD and he remains uh, symptom free. I think uh, there are a lot of problems with the room criteria for um, CHS. I think uh, it's important for patients to be able to actually abstain, particularly if you have very severe vomiting and you're using it daily, um, to, be, to be able to abstain for at least six months to a year. Um, because what happens as in, and I haven't shown this data, but we have, uh, you know, there are other investigators have shown um, that when you have chronic cannabis use on a daily basis, you cause down-regulation of CB1 receptors. So the CB1 receptors in the brain, there are fewer and fewer receptors and they're kind of falling off. Um, you're like, it's like burning a dogwood you know, forest. Um, and so if you want that forest to repopulate, it's not going to happen immediately. You will have to stop that cannabis um, for a considerable amount of time. CB1 receptors don't just kind of pop up um, you know, immediately. And I will say that um, all of this is based on data. And I also work um, with a collaborator who's a world's expert in cannabis, and she has a Lifetime Achievement Award um, by the ICRS and the cannabinoid societies. And, and, and so I think these are all important points to remember. Uh, we also looked, along with the CVS guidelines, um, you know, obviously this is something that we really need to know about. And so we looked. Um, at uh, chronic cannabis use and CHS versus CVS. Um, and so we um, really pulled data from 2000 to 2018. We extracted um, the charts. I mean, we extracted studies. And out of this, there were 105 individual case reports at the time we did this, along with 25 case series with 271 patients. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, that's not a significant number, but that was what was there. And then when we looked at them, uh, we found that unfortunately, most of the literature, um, you know, they didn't have the Rome criteria at that time, but when we retroactively tried to apply the Rome criteria, it was very difficult to try and actually see if they had a real diagnosis of CVS because um, really the follow-up was very low in these patients. Um, so uh, follow-up of the abstinence was only 16%. So we really, it was very hard to tell if these patients actually had cannabinoid hyperemesis or if the cannabis use was contributing to their vomiting in some ways. The other important things is the duration of cannabis use tended to be, um, tended to be for around six to eight years. Um, and then, you know, certainly daily use, as you can see, there was a significant proportion of patients with daily use um, they were more likely to be male. And the hot water bathing pattern uh, was seen, not in all patients, but a significant proportion of patients. And uh, what about this hot shower? And uh, certainly there is a significant statistical association of this hot water bathing behavior with cannabis use and cyclic vomiting, but it's not pathognomonic, which means that um, you know, a lot of physicians will say, oh my God, you're doing the hot shower, so you have CHS, and that's not true because uh, the, CA, uh, the hot water bathing pattern is actually seen in 48% of CVS patients. So almost half the patients who do not use cannabis versus 74% with cannabis use. So, you know, it cannot be used as a differentiating feature, though I will say that uh, it is associated, uh, there is a very high association with cannabis use. Um, again, we did a study on this hot shower bathing pattern because we wanted to see what's going on. Um, and again, a lot of people, and then we divided this cohort um, of patients into what is called the OU and the CU group. And so we looked at people, you know, again, you remember that little section, um, little pie chart I showed you, where people used it more than four times a week. Uh, we call them the regular cannabis users based on this validated tool we have. And um, we found that, again, these patients were regular users were more likely to be male. 
And um, I'm sorry, I should probably, so anything below 0 0.05 is what is called statistically significant. So there's a less than 5% chance that it happened by chance. So that means that, uh, you know, this is significantly different between these two groups. Um, and then we looked, you know, everybody knows about the warning phase and the vomiting phase. So, um, you know, the patients who actually use cannabis a lot tended to have more symptoms. Uh, they reported having more symptoms. They actually reported having more panic symptoms. And they tended to use very hot water compared to those, um, you know, who did not use cannabis as regularly. During the vomiting phase, again, they tended to have more symptoms. So these patients who were doing this had more symptoms. And uh, whether it is because of the cannabis use that they had more symptoms or whether they already had more symptoms and they're just very sick and they were trying to use cannabis uh, is unclear. Um, and then we look to see, you know, because this can actually give us some insight into the physiology or the pathophysiology um, of how this hot showers and uh, CVS works. And so when we looked um, to see how long it takes for relief of symptoms, most of you told us that it takes maybe about five to 10 minutes uh, to feel better. Uh, and this is just the breakup by the different symptoms. So abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And so it's somewhere ballpark uh, between five to 15 minutes or more than 10 minutes in many instances. And then uh, when you looked at relapse per symptoms, and again, um, you know, patients tell that, you know, really tell us about this all the time. So um, it takes about, um, most patients say that it takes about 10 to 13 minutes. So symptoms relapse, and that's why people keep showering over and over again, and people run out of hot water, and so on and so forth. And this has uh, some very interesting connotations um, for the physiology, and I don't think we have so much time to get into that, but I'm happy to take answers. Um, you know, at the end. Um, and so, um, be as it may, I think uh, there are certain potential causes for hyperemesis. One is a genetic predisposition. Uh, just like alcohol, unfortunately, we, it's just a drop of luck. And there are some people who actually have certain genes whereby, um, you know, they, they may be genetically predisposed to develop vomiting, um, as I showed you in some of my pre previous slides. Uh, and, and patients with CVS, and this is something that I think is very intriguing, that you know, patients with CVS have an inherent endocannabinoid deficiency. So um, we have done some studies and we uh, looked at this, and it seems that patients with CVS are not able to mount sufficient, um, a sufficient uh, or robust endocannabinoid response. Say when you're stressed, uh, you really need to produce endocannabinoids. And how cannabis use is actually um, kind of uh, hampering this internal mechanism is unclear. I told you about the potency of cannabis products, so that is very, very important. You really need to know, um, you know, what you're smoking or putting in your mouth. Um, and I will tell you that most of the products have more THC than CBD, so uh, this is an entirely different beast that we're talking about. And uh, so, um, you know, the future, of course, there are lots of exciting things, and, um, you know, I'm happy to say, finally, um, you know, um, from being the underdog, there are some studies going on, and I hope you will all take the time to participate um, in, in all of these studies that, um, you know, are upcoming. Um, and so, you know, there is a drug that's in the pipeline for CVS, and we've also, um, you know, we also have these ideas. And so, you know, I told you about the endocannabinoid system, and can we improve this? Can we increase the endocannabinoid tone? So there are actually uh, molecules or things that are already manufactured called FA inhibitors. So FA is the enzyme that degrades endocannabinoids. And so if you inhibit FA or you kind of re reduce FA, then you can increase your endocannabinoid tone and perhaps, um, you know, stop the vomiting. So uh, there are so many drugs. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm, but there was a bad clinical trial and it was really um, uh, a study in France that went bad. And so that kind of stopped things a little bit, but it was not because of FAR inhibition. Um, and you'll have to, oh gosh, the, 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 the chemists and the basic scientists will kind of bash themselves up, you know, talking about this. But be as it may, there's a lot of, I think, potential um, using the endocannabinoid system and even simple things like, um, you know, exercise can actually increase your endocannabinoid tone, just 20 minutes of exercise every day. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think there's a great debate. I think it's very important uh, not to be judgmental. I think uh, there's certainly a lot of um, research, uh, you know, research in this area, but not enough. 
um, because unfortunately the funding has not kept up with the pace of uh, legalization of um, cannabis use. And um, you know, so just be careful because if you're using weed and it's a very high concentrate and you're continuing to farm it, um, that may be a problem. You may actually feel a little better, but um, you know, your vomiting is coming back. So uh, though you may feel better at that moment, um, it may be actually making your CVS worse in the long run. And um, so I'm going to end my talk a little bit. I told Debbie I'll be, um, you know, I'll kind of do it for half an hour. I went over a little bit. Uh, but I do think we have time, uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, I would really like to acknowledge uh, several of my mentors, my nurses, um, who have really been so helpful and instrumental um, in everything uh, that I do. And of course, you see Kathleen Adams uh, and her daughter Molly there. And um, this is Bee Lee, that's something his son made, and I use of it because I think that's very apt. Um, this is Herschel Raff, who works on stress hormones. It's a great guy. And Cecilia Hillard, who's sort of the, the part queen, if you will, of the world. And then a group of my nurses uh, who helped me. So thank you for listening. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. And I will try and get myself, hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. B. That was great. Yeah. Um, I, so I've been writing questions down in the chat, so I'll ask you some of them. Um, the first question I had was, and I apologize if I say these names wrong, That's okay. um, but indica helps, but sativa, sativa seems to cause cycles. Do you have any insight as to why that could be? Yeah, so I will say that, um, you know, indica is less commonly used um, to manufacture various uh, cannabis products and, and there's not enough data really. And when somebody says help, whether it's indica or sativa, uh, I think the important thing is the composition. Uh, and like I said, most patients who use cannabis by patient reports say it helps, but then it also continues to, you know, cause the vomiting. And so I think therein lies the paradox. And whether it's indica or sativa, I think it's important to look at how much, what is the concentration of THC versus CBD and how often is it being used? So, I mean, certainly, I mean, perhaps, uh, this particular product in response to this, uh, you know, um, patient's question. Um, it may be that the composition of the cannabis product from indica is different um, from sativa. And so that may explain the differential kind of effects um, that he's seeing. Great, thank you for that information. Um, how can there be a review of benefits from cannabis if cannabis cannot be studied as diligently due to scheduling? Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I, th I think basically what they're asking, well, I'll read it again, but how can there be a review of benefits from cannabis if cannabis cannot be studied as diligently due to scheduling? I think they're t referring to the regulations, right? Um, yeah, possibly. Yeah, no, that's actually a very, uh, that is true. That is a very, um, you know, valid question. And um, it, it is problematic because, you know, how do you study something um, that's illegal in many states? And we have this hodgepodge map, um, you know, some states it's legal, some states it's not legal. In Wisconsin, it's completely illegal. Um, and, and so when I actually, um, you know, these are uh, barriers, hurdles to research uh, that investigators face, but I will tell you that uh, to a patient, there is something we obtain, even for my study uh, that we did uh, looking at cannabis use patterns, um, we uh, obtain what is called a certificate of confidentiality first. Uh, so the certificate of confidentiality is something we get from the government, which means that as a researcher, I do not have to really uh, disclose any information about uh, patients who uh, participate in all these research studies. Um, and, and there are one or two uh, you know, exceptions like you know, pedophilia and stuff, obviously. But otherwise, um, I don't have to disclose to other agencies um, about who used marijuana and where they got it. So there is a, there is a degree of protection um, you know, that participants uh, do have. And um, 
you know, even if you look at the cannabis study and, you know, the C samples and so on. And so there is that layer of protection, but it is a barrier. Um, and it is a good question um, that is being asked. Um, this is how we try and circumvent that. Okay, thank you. You cut out just a little bit in there, but I think um, we got the picture that it's, um, that it's, um, it's doable, but not great. Yes. <laughs> um, what about patients that also have neurodegenerative or terminal disease? Stopping uh, marijuana use could make that patient lose more time or lower, lower the quality of life too much to justify the use of marijuana. So I think basically saying that show they're trying to show yeah. that the marijuana is not causing their vomiting, but that they actually do have CDS. Um, so she's asking what what can be done in those situ in that situation? Yeah, I mean, so certainly if you have a terminal neurodegenerative disease and, and, and having seen so many CVS patients, I mean, I will say that, um, you know, they're, they're rarer, that we have CVS patients, with people with CVS and, you know, terminal or really bad neurodegenerative disease. Um, certainly there is data supporting the use of cannabis in uh, pain and, like I said, neurodegenerative diseases, and I even spoke about this compound, right? In, um, I think, multiple sclerosis, like Sativex, that was actually studied. Um, and so, yeah, those compounds are out there. And I think um, if that's going to be done, then um, it would be important to use um, agents or drugs that have been studied. Um, for instance, uh, if it is a neurodegenerative disease, um, you know, obviously there are studies in Sativex, um, which is an oral mucosal spray. And so I would rather somebody use something that has been studied than just getting it off the market um, because those are not regulated that well. So you don't know, you cannot uh, control for dose, you cannot control for potency and so on and so, so on and so forth. For instance, you know, the FDA, if you, if you buy Tylenol and you buy 500 milligrams of Tylenol over the counter, you're not, you know you're getting that. But uh, when, you, when you smoke it in a joint, and you don't know, right? Even like the other patient said, um, we don't know. Is it, in, is it indica? Is it sativa? What is the concentration? Is it all like labeled? Uh, and, and there's so much of variation in all of that. So I think if that's going to be used, um, certainly, you know, using products that have been studied uh, will be helpful. Thank you. Or something I would recommend. Yeah, that's helpful. How do you suggest periodic cannabis users navigate the ER when told they just need to stop using cannabis and they will stop vomiting? Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> I don't, so I don't think, uh, you know, we can go around with a little cudgel, you know, telling our ER colleagues not to say <laughs> that or even, you know, so many other people and it's out there in the literature, right? So um, I think uh, occasional cannabis use may not be problematic uh, but be as it may, it is, um, I can understand your pain. And that's why we try to uh, provide uh, studies and literature and study the problem. Because I know that, you know, there's this ER physician by name, Habushi, who goes around telling people that their CHS is an epidemic. And I will say that's unfortunately without drubbing him, that's one of the worst papers I have ever read. <laughs> and so I think some of the publications that we have, for instance, um, you know, we have raised several important questions uh, about that, you know, and we have questioned um, as to uh, what the CHS is. And even if you go to our systematic review um, and say, you know, one maybe is gently educating or saying, hey, okay, you're saying this, but here's this paper and it doesn't seem to be clear. And so I think there needs to be a lot of education there definitely needs to be no more participation from CVS patients, more research, more funding. Um, and um, it is true that there is more funding actually to study the adverse effects than, um, than, I'm sorry, than positive effects. Um, so, um, well, I used to have a screen here. But... You can't do it because you've seen her screen. You can't. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, I just lost my train of thought. But um, so I think research and so on and so forth uh, and, and really education uh, will hopefully help in um, sorting this uh, kind of problem out. And it may be important to even tell your ER physician or 
somebody else uh, or the nurse, or maybe even when you're healthy, you know, say, hey, you know what, I don't use as much marijuana, but it is, you know, daily use is a problem. And I think there's a lot of reluctance on, uh, you know, the part of people to perhaps acknowledge that this is playing a role. It may not be causative, but it may be making it worse. Um, and it's not the same for everybody, unfortunately, just like alcohol. We uh, know that there are people who drink alcohol like fish and, uh, you know, they don't have cirrhosis. They don't have any major problems. They're going around and doing their work. And then there are people who have major problems. So I think, um, you know, we have to look at the context, the individual patient, um, you know, if somebody is say 56 or 60 and is using a little cannabis for pain or neurodegenerative disorders or whatever that's different, as opposed to somebody who starts um, using cannabis heavily as an adolescent, because there is ample data to show that that is more problematic um, in adolescents. You know, adolescent brains are growing brains and it, it affects um, the growing brain. Um, so it is a very complicated problem and, um, you know, sometimes I actually do tell people, hey, why don't you just abstain from it? At least um, if you abstain and you continue to vomit, you can prove to them that it's not the cannabis and you have to do it long enough. If you have a negative screen and you're still vomiting, um, you know, then you have actually proven that you probably don't have CHS and that it's not the cannabis that's causing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a couple of people are asking about the drug that you mentioned that is in the um, works for CBS that's being developed. Yeah, so I think Debbie and I kind of know about it and, uh, you know, it is confidential at this moment and uh, we hope to have, uh, you know, we hope to have trials, I don't know, hopefully next year, in the end of next year maybe. Um, and I'm working on an IRB and, uh, you know, we will, this I probably can talk about, we will, uh, you know, have a study pretty soon trying to predict CVS episodes based on a constellation of symptoms. So certainly uh, those studies are coming up because ideally, um, you know, when you have a drug, you want to know if you can accurately predict when you're having your next CVS episode. And if you can accurately predict it by maybe just wearing an Apple watch, um, <clears throat> Uh, on your um, wrist and then say, hey, okay, there's a red sign going off, then that can help. So there are some studies, uh, as I say, a prelude, uh, a prelude to the, uh, the drug trial. So we hope, right, Debbie, and I basically talking to people there that uh, the end of uh, 2021, uh, we can hope to have trials. I mean, it's in the pipeline, but it's ways away. So yeah. Um, yeah. From, I would say you probably have more information than we do, but from our understanding, of course, COVID um, really put a damper on the um, study for that particular um, medication that they're working on. Yeah, no, COVID has put a damper on pretty much like everything. Uh, yeah. And it's very <laughs> unfortunate because we are struggling uh, yep. with resources and enough time and not being able to, you know, really um, do our work. Um, yep. and, 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 you know, everybody is uh, stressed, I think, right? Because it's impacted almost every aspect of your life. Um, but hopefully, you know, uh, we can get past all of this. And um, yes, it is a damper, but I don't know, maybe I'm just an eternal optimist. So <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> there won't be light. You know, there's a tunnel because there's a light at the end of it. So let's think of it that way. Yep. Uh, what can be done for extreme stomach pain in the R? I'm given morphine. Um, other suggestions. They're asking for other suggestions. Yeah. Um, so abdominal pain is a huge component of CVS, and it's a big problem. Um, certainly, we have a lot of um, you know antiemetics. You know, some of the pain is also I think uh, related to the entire kind of psychological profile. Or characteristics of the CVS episode. There's a lot of anxiety, um, and 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 we know, you know, these opiates is, is like a double-edged sword, right? Um, and and we have seen a lot of people who have gotten addicted to opiates and so on and so forth. So we continuously look for non-opiate, um, you know, alternatives. Uh, we did try studying something called the IV stem or the bridge device in CVS in the ER for pain. Uh, it's, um, you know, Katya Kovacic has done a lot of work, has done a lot of work on the neurostimulator device, uh, which actually treats pain. Um, whether, I don't know if it's necessarily effective in an acute CVS episode, 
um, unfortunately, there was there are some um, ER physicians, not everywhere, um, who have used a combination or who you, who have used uh, ketamine um, for treating pain um, in the emergency room. Uh, it is not fully published yet, uh, but I do know that the Pittsburgh people had that study, and I do know some people who use ketamine for pain. Uh, we don't know the long-term addiction potential of ketamine, but it's certainly better than opioids. Because I think it's important, you know, to understand pain is very complex, um, and um, you know, our brain controls um, all of these symptoms and so on and so forth. Um, and so there are some uh, non-opioid approaches that we could potentially use. Um, and while we use opioids as, you know, really if we absolutely have to in the ER, the hospital, um, I would not necessarily, I would not. Um, advocate um, advocate um, for using it, particularly on a regular basis or an outpatient basis. It should be used uh, infrequently and um, sparingly to have any effect. But those Thank two are the non-opioid alternatives. Again, you know, funding and time and resources are barriers um, and participation actually. And, and people who want to, I know some of you are, um, you know, I don't know how many of my patients are on this, but uh, have been very generous, and um, and and my hope is that uh, we can engage together because we need physicians, we need community partners, we need the CBSA, but ultimately we need you um, because that's the only way that we can move all this forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we probably have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, it sounds I can, um, I can hang on for a little bit more. Debbie. Okay, we can go beyond three. I mean, I can go to even. Yeah, we can keep going. Okay. It sounds clearly best to avoid high THC content cannabis, but from your list, it looks like CBD can actually increase your body's endocannabinoid tone. I, they're asking, I guess, if CBD can actually increase your body's endocannabinoid tone. No. So CBD is, uh, you know, um, THC and CBD are two constituents of marijuana, okay? Uh, they're not endocannabinoids. Endo means in the body. So these are phytocannabinoids. Um, so CBD does not increase endocannabinoid uh, tone. It can help with other things, um, you know, like stress and vomiting and so on. It doesn't mess with your head or doesn't cause the high that THC has. Uh, THC is the one uh, that is what we call the main psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, you know, whether you smoke it or um, edibles or so on and so forth. And THC is the one that can um, mess you up, if you will, because it's been associated with anxiety and psychosis, even though um, it can cause angiolysis. And they have studied this both um, in animals and so many studies where we have seen a consistent pattern where, say, a low dose, like, you know, they've done the animal studies where you, you, do, you use a low dose of THC and then it's like the animal is kind of happy and relaxed. And then you increase the dose and it's going crazy. So um, it is what we call a biphasic effect. So you know how they say everything in moderation. So a pinch of it may be good, but if you take more than a pinch, it may be bad. Um, you know, similar to digoxin, or they don't use that much of digoxin. Digoxin is something uh, that is derived from the digitalis for pure plant. And it was used a lot in heart diseases. Uh, but it's also, um, you know, you can cause toxicity and cardiac arrest if you use too much of it. Um, uh, however, I won't say that uh, can cannabis does not kill people, but I'm just trying to explain to you that it is what we call a biphasic effect. So low doses um, can uh, cause, you know, have an anti-emetic effect or prevent uh, nausea and vomiting, while higher doses can actually have the opposite effect. And CBD is, uh, yeah, doesn't have anything to do with, in fact, um, you know, like I said, the endocannabinoid tone or the endocannabinoid signaling, um, you have a baseline endocannabinoid tone, and then you have this sudden production of endocannabinoids or synthesis, synthesis uh, when you're faced with a stressor, you know, maybe our ancestors or, you know, forefathers, it was like a tiger in the room, but now maybe it's your boss showing up or something terrible happening. Um, you know, or COVID or whatever it is. And so endocannabinoids help you mitigate and, and, and really bring your body back to homeostasis. And when you keep using cannabis, you're actually kind of interfering with that endocannabinoid signaling, right? Because your body is not used to or 
doesn't see the cannabis plant. So that's something you're doing to yourself. Very interesting. Is there a test for CB1 receptor if there's a dip? Um, is there a test for a deficiency in the CB1 receptor? Yeah, that's a very a good question. <laughs> and um, so there is, a, you know, it's, I've been trying to work um, with my collaborator, Dr. Hillard, and um, at least in, in humans, you, you can isolate a CB1 receptor and you can kind of do a quantification, but that test is not uh, very good. We can measure endocannabinoids very well. Um, you know, and then uh, you can do like maybe imaging studies or in, in kind of animals, you do different things. So as a, found as an e easy test, uh, there was one assay uh, that was developed, but it's, it's not perfect. And um, I mean, I hope something comes out of it, but at this point, it's, it's hard to do in a human uh, study. I mean, they do it in like rats and so on and so forth, where they, you know, slice their brains and look to see how much of CB1 receptor activity there is and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? I think so. Just trying to find um, what flowers and vapes that are are that are CBD only. If these are not considered true cannabinoids, will they help vomiting or affect CBS? Um, you know, I'm I'm not so. Uh, again, I don't endorse CBD because we haven't studied it, right? Um, but if you told me that it's only CBD, I, I would be less likely to be worried um, because it could help um, with other things and, and not hurt you. Uh, and as you see, it's all about balance. And if you look at the, the marijuana product at some point, you know, somebody just took a bunch of leaves or whatever and put it in a cigarette, you had so much of THC and so much of CBD that was found in nature. And now we have actually come, almost reversed that ratio. So um, I think CBD alone, I would have less of a problem because based on the data and the evidence that we have so far. Um, I do think TNC, TNC is, is really the culprit. That makes, definitely makes sense. Um, someone is looking for information on endocannabinoids um, versus a serotonin link. Endocannabinoids and serotonin link? Mm -hmm. Well, um, endocannabinoids typically work on cannabinoid receptors. Uh, how they cross link with serotonin receptors, I mean, they, they are important in the regulation of nausea, vomiting, and stress. Um, I mean, serotonin, uh, the serotonin system is also important on these things, and I I don't have a clear answer for that. I don't know that there's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this is actually a little bit off of your um, cannabinoid topic, but I think you'll still CBRP. have an answer. Why does noratriptyline work for CBS? Yeah, um, so um, nobody really knows actually. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I will say that, so, um, so noratriptyline is like a dirty drug. Uh, which means it acts on several receptors, okay? And, uh, but we do know there is at least, uh, you know, studies to show uh, that it also actually affects, it has some interaction with cannabinoid receptors. And so we were very excited when we did our study and we found that there are certain patients who have certain mutations in the cannabinoid receptor uh, were more likely to... Uh, respond to tricyclic antidepressants, which means amitriptyline or nortriptyline. So there seems to be a connection between uh, the endocannabinoid system and amitriptyline and a person's uh, ability to, in, you know, kind of respond to that. We did put in a grant um, to the NIH, but we got a stinging rejection after, <laughs> well, we got a rejection after being scored well. I think that just wasn't enough funding and they don't think CVS is as important, but um, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Nobody really knows, but there's clues we have. Great. Has there been any research done on the effectiveness of other cannabinoids such as CBG and CBN for treatment? Not that I know of. I think the most important ones are THC and CBD. Uh, certainly there's no uh, research in CBS. 
And those are considered the most important compounds because there are like 200 compounds constituents yeah. in, in cannabis. Um, and then I have one more question. I think I got most of them in the chat box. Um, someone is asking if you are available to do televisits. Gosh, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, so yes and no. And, and I will say that, uh, gosh, I am so uh, disappointed and frustrated with everything that's going on because uh, once the pandemic hit, I thought the only silver line to this pandemic is that it would allow me to do telemedicine visits. And initially we were told it, it would. And so people were calling in from wherever. And then uh, once, I don't know, the money, it all has to do with money and things. <laughs> and so then we were told that uh, it was only neighboring states that would allow us to do that. And I don't know if it is, uh, uh, it is something to do with Wisconsin versus the other states and people just wanting to kind of keep business, if you will, within their own state. Again, I have no idea how all that works. It's beyond above my pay grade. Uh, and unfortunately, now they nixed Michigan. So we were just told this morning that we cannot do telemedicine visits with Michigan. We can do it with Illinois and Iowa, not with okay. Michigan anymore. Okay, Illinois and Iowa. So it, is, okay. it is just very disturbing that uh, in a pandemic, uh, you know, people are not allowed to do telemedicine visits and, and, and um, it, it's, it's just such a disservice to patients. And so I would say call your representative and um, yeah, tell them you want it. <laughs> for sure, right? We have to advocate for some of these things um, at times. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you. Telemedicine would be such a critical piece, especially with what's going on in the world right now. Yeah. Um, I think I got all the questions. Um, I just want to thank you again, um, Dr. V, so much for joining us today. Um, I always learn something new whenever you talk about um cannabis and cannabinoids um so i want to thank you very much and i want to thank everyone else for um tuning in and um uh and listening today and this will the recording will be on our youtube channel um eventually usually we get it on in about a week um yeah thank you very much oh and thank you to my thank you to my co-host belinda as well i appreciate um all her help getting people admitted and things like that. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much, Debbie, for having me. Yes, of course. Yeah. Bye -bye. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah, you too. I know there's some chats popping up and I Yeah, no, I think most of it's thanking us. I will quickly post in here our YouTube channel link though. Um okay. all of our videos I are are posted there. So I will post pop that in there quick. Um if you um just give me a moment to get the correct screen popped up i will share it it's also on our website um but all of our videos are put into the youtube channel so there we go there's our youtube channel all right thank, thank you thank you everyone yeah thank you everyone for joining